One of the most beautiful things about the craft of writing is that it is a skill you can always continue to improve. It's important to continue sharpening your writing skills to ensure that you are crafting sentences that are as strong as possible and conveying your story effectively to readers. Today, I'm going to go through five writing mistakes that I commonly see in manuscripts that I edit and walk you through examples of how to fix them. And these are going to be more sentence level mistakes that really get into the nitty gritty of your prose. While these mistakes are likely to be made more commonly among new or amateur writers, there are definitely seasoned pros who make some of these mistakes as well. So if you're anywhere along this spectrum of your writing career, I recommend checking them out and seeing if you can find any of them in your manuscript. No matter how strong your writing is, it is possible to slip up and fall into some of these mistakes, especially the more subtle ones. So it's always valuable to go back in your manuscript and self-edit with these tips in mind. And these tips will apply across genres, but are mostly geared toward writers who are working on fiction projects. If you are a fiction writer or you're potentially working on a book project or interested in the publishing industry, I recommend subscribing to my channel. Every week I either go through writing tips like this or I talk about the publishing industry and I would love to have you around. So let's dive into the first writing mistake, which is redundant phrasing. This is when your sentence includes extraneous words or phrases, typically descriptive phrases, that are actually already implied by other words in the sentence. So as a result, your sentence just becomes a little bit clunky and bulky and you can distill it down and simplify it. You'll actually be able to get the exact same meaning across without those extra words. So this just really helps ensure that your prose is smooth and clear and concise. Redundant phrasing is one of those writing mistakes that even the most seasoned of writers can accidentally fall into. And we also use redundant phrasing in our own speech patterns. So it's one that's really, really helpful to be able to recognize and identify in your own work. So let's go through one quick, simple example. Above the stars were visible in the dark pitch black sky. Can you identify where there is redundant phrasing? Dark and pitch black essentially convey the same thing. So you don't need both of those descriptors here. In fact, I would revise this to be a little bit different. Above, the stars were visible in the night sky. Night sky already implies black, dark, and the fact that the stars are visible will signal to the reader that it is dark or black. So I would just say night sky in this case. The second mistake is heavy handed foreshadowing. Now you as the author have a full picture into how all of the nuances of your story play out from start to finish. And your skill lies in delivering that story effectively to readers. But sometimes to try and establish suspense, authors will lean into some heavy handed foreshadowing language in an attempt to build the reader's anticipation for what is going to come in a future scene. Often this language will come in at the end of a scene or the end of a chapter. I often find these bits of foreshadowing just a bit overdramatic, maybe even melodramatic. It almost feels like the narrator is winking or nudging at the reader. And if the plot development in question is going to occur in one of the subsequent scenes that we're very close to seeing on the page, I just don't find it necessary to include this type of foreshadowing. And I prefer to really just experience that surprise and shock of the plot development when it actually happens. So let me show you an example of this. Brittany went to bed that night in blissful ignorance. Little did she know that tomorrow she would receive news that would change her life forever. So that second sentence is telling the reader that something is going to happen to Brittany. She's going to find out something the next day that is going to drastically alter the path of her life and presumably the path of this story. Now, because this is going to happen tomorrow, I just recommend omitting that sentence entirely and just letting the reader see that news get delivered when it gets delivered. So I would just revise this line to be something like, Brittany was blissful when she went to bed that night and just cut the scene there. The fact that you are calling attention to Brittany being blissful when she goes to sleep that night already gives the reader a little inkling of suspicion that something is going to go wrong. 
So that's a much more subtle approach rather than this heavy handed foreshadowing that really tells the reader exactly what they have to expect in the next scene. The third writing mistake is subject and verb disagreement. Now subject verb agreement is one of the basic principles of English language. But when you are writing stylized fiction and you have complex sentence structures, it can actually be quite easy to accidentally mix up your subject verb agreement. You always want to make sure that your verb structures relate back and apply directly to the subject of the sentence. Otherwise, if it is unclear what subject the verb is supposed to match to, it's going to be very difficult for the reader to actually interpret what you're trying to convey. This issue most often occurs when you are using a gerund as an adjective phrase modifying the subject at the start of a sentence. And if you, like me, have forgotten all about sentence components and parts since middle grade English, then let me just show you an example and you will be able to see what I mean. Sweating profusely, the run home took longer than Mark anticipated. Can you see what's wrong with this sentence? Technically, the subject of this sentence is the run, and therefore the phrase sweating profusely is applying to the run. However, we know that a run cannot sweat profusely. So even if you're able to understand the meaning of this sentence, which is that Mark is sweating profusely, you still want to make sure that your sentence is clear and grammatically correct. So you would rephrase to something like this. Sweating profusely, Mark ran home, the journey taking longer than anticipated. Now, Mark is directly related to that phrase, sweating profusely. The fourth mistake is not putting flashbacks in the distant past. If you are writing a work of fiction, lots of times you will incorporate flashbacks to talk about a character's memory or something that they've experienced in the past that then comes back to relevance in the primary narrative. However, when you do this, keep in mind that the flashback must be differentiated from the primary narrative or it will be difficult for the reader to tell what is going on in the primary narrative and what is going on in the flashback, especially if you flesh out the flashback as a full scene. If you are writing your story in the past tense, which is the most common tense to write a fiction story in, then your flashbacks need to be written in the past perfect tense, which is the tense where you have had before the verb phrase. This will show that Everything in the past perfect tense belongs in the flashback versus everything in the regular past tense is what's happening in the primary narrative. Again, this will become much clearer with the example, so let me read through that. Mary thought about the night she first met Jacob. They were at prom dancing with their dates. She caught his eye across the room and smiled. Turning away from his date, he walked over to Mary. So every sentence in this passage is written in the past tense, the simple past tense, which technically means this is all being attributed to the primary narrative. And it's difficult to tell when we are actually entering the flashback from what Mary is currently doing in the scene. So let me show you how you would revise this to differentiate the flashback. Mary thought about the night she first met Jacob. They had been at prom dancing with their dates. She had caught his eye across the room and smiled. Turning away from his date, he'd walked over to Mary. So all of the verb phrases that belong to the flashback now have that past perfect tense, and therefore we are able to tell what happened in the distant past versus what is happening in the present narrative. The last writing mistake I wanna go over today is an undefined it. Now, a sentence with it as one of the subjects might be perfectly grammatically correct, and it's not necessarily going to set off any of your writing software flags or warnings. But make sure that any time you are writing a sentence that contains it, it is very clear what it is referring back to. Otherwise, the meaning of the sentence is going to get very quickly muddled and difficult to interpret. Let's look at an example of an undefined it. Claire was worried about her test results, yet excited about going on the date with Josh. It made her toss and turn as she tried to sleep. Can you identify what that it is referring to specifically? It's not clear. It could be the worry about her test results, or it could be her excitement about her date with Josh, or it could be both, we don't know. So let's look at a revised version that more specifically clarifies the meaning. 
Claire was worried about her test results, yet excited about going on the date with Josh. The anxious mix of emotions made her toss and turn as she tried to sleep. So here we see that it's the anxious mix of emotions, so therefore it is both her worry about the results and her excitement for the date that are making her toss and turn at night. This helps your prose be so much clearer and helps build your authority as a storyteller because the reader trusts that you are going to make it very clear to them what exactly you are conveying in the scene and what exactly is going on in a given scene. I hope these tips help you craft stronger, more streamlined, and more deliberate and authoritative sentences that build up to a more effective story overall. After all, Every story is just a collection of sentences, so you want to make sure that each and every sentence is as clear as possible. Let me know in the comments if you've seen yourself fall into any of these mistakes, or if you have any other grammatical or sentence level mix-ups that I could potentially help with. And if you are interested in some more tips for how to craft stronger sentences and stronger stories, check out my video on mistakes I often see in the close third person narratives. That will be really, really helpful for you if you are currently writing a story in close third person. And as always, if you found this video helpful, please hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. It helps me know I'm bringing you content that you like and find helpful and allows me to grow this community. Thanks so much for watching and happy writing.